When we stopped last week, Jesus and the disciples had just crossed the Sea of Galilee in a flotilla of boats. I alerted you that what happens next is found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels and that the shortest and least embellished version is in Matthew. His location for the story makes more sense than the one in Mark and Luke. So I'm thinking that Matthew's version is probably closer to the original. But there are other differences as well. Uh, Matthew's version says Jesus meets two demon-possessed men when he steps off the boat, while Mark and Luke say there's just one man. So it seems likely that Mark and Luke used the same source for their stories, and that that source is different than the one Matthew used. And it is possible that Matthew's version may have been an eyewitness account. He could definitely have been there, um, but there's no way to know for sure. The one-man version is the more commonly told version of this story. In all three versions, the man lives away from town among the tombs. In Matthew's version, the two men are violent and prevent anyone from passing. But in Mark's version, the man has been captured and bound in chains and ankle irons. But he's broken free of the chains and he now runs through the hills, crying loudly and cutting himself. Luke adds that in addition to breaking through the chains on his hands and feet, he overcomes his guards and now lives naked among the tombs. <laughs> All that sounds a little bit like embellishment, doesn't it? I think Matthew's simple, the men are violent and prevent people from passing that way, is probably closer to what actually happened here. In Luke's version, Jesus commands the impure spirit to come out of the man. And Mark's version is even more dramatic. He has Jesus hollering from far away while the man is still in the distance, shouting, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Matthew has no such dramatics. In all three versions, the man or men address Jesus and acknowledge him as the son of God, which is really interesting that that core bit is in all three versions. This seems to be a pattern in the gospels. It's not unusual for um, uh, evil in whatever form to recognize Jesus immediately as the son of God and to recognize him as an existential threat. The men cry, what are we to you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Now notice that the word torture is also used in all three versions. The word can also be translated as torment, torment or torture. This is definitely a hell sort of word. It is not the Gehenna word Jesus typically uses. Jesus only talks about a place or a moment of deep regret where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This torture word is a different word altogether. I looked this word up. It is used 13 times in the New Testament. Once, was back when Jesus healed the centurion slave who was suffering terrible physical torment. It's used twice later to describe a boat being battered by a storm. It's used once to describe how a righteous man feels about the evil deeds he sees perpetrated in the world. And it is used twice in Revelation to describe suffering on earth during the end times on earth, not, you know, is just the suffering that happens in the widespread in the end times. And it's used once to describe a woman in labor. Obviously, none of those passages have anything to do with hell. And that leaves only these three verses here in the story we're reading plus two more verses in Revelation that use the word torture or torment. Let's look at those two verses. Revelation 14.10 says there will be eternal torment 
in burning sulfur of those who worship the minions of Satan, the, the beast in his image, are, and receive the mark 666 on their hand or forehead so they can buy or sell. Now remember, Revelation, the whole thing is a dream. It, it is also apocalyptic writing. It's, an, it's a genre, kind of like you know, sci-fi is a genre or romance is a genre. Apocalyptic writing is a particular way of writing. It uses particular kinds of imagery. It's extreme in the extreme. And we're going to look at this verse in its context when we get to Revelation, um, if you want to take the class series on Revelation. But the thing to notice now is that this eternal torment is for Satan's minions and worshipers and that Jesus is not speaking. Jesus never uses this term or phrase or idea at all. Revelation is written by John in his extreme old age. It is an apocalypse framed as his recollection of a dream or a vision that he has. There's one more verse in Revelation that says again, that the devil and his minions are tormented forever and ever. But notice why they are tormented, at least according to this passage. They are tormented because they deceived God's people. That does not sound like God has plans to torment his beloved people, does it? Even if they're misguided or sin or miss the mark or fall short or screw up, they're, they're not in view here. Both of these verses address the devil and his minions, and only one of the verses addresses people at all, and the people in view are those who are intentionally worshiping the minions of Satan. And all of this is a reflection of the worldview of this time, the culture of Jesus' day. This is their view of what happens to evil personified when God comes to set everything right. I find it super interesting that these two verses are the only ones where this word torment is used with any sense of hell or punishment associated with it. So now it makes a lot more sense when we read that the demons beg Jesus not to torture or torment them before the appointed time. We now know this passage is referring to the end time, perhaps to this season described in those two verses in Revelation where God banishes evil forever. In Mark and Luke, there's added dialogue between the demons and Jesus. Jesus asks, what is your name? And the demons answer, legion, because there are many of them in this poor man. Matthew is silent here, so it looks like this could be more embellishment. In all three accounts, all three, the demons realize Jesus is actually going to cast them out. In Matthew's account, they ask Jesus to send them into a herd of pigs. Now, Jesus is a Jew. Why would he be anywhere near a herd of pigs? Well, that's because the Decapolis, this particular region to the east, southeast of Galilee, really all of the east of Galilee, uh, is Gentile territory. So having a herd of pigs would not be out of place. In Mark's account, the demons beg Jesus not to send them out of the area. But in Luke's account, the demons beg Jesus not to send them into the abyss. In the worldview of this time, the abyss is the opposite of heaven. Outside of Revelation, it's only used like one other time in a brief quote. But in Revelation, the abyss is referred to seven times. And every time, it is a metaphor for the place of the destroying angel, the bottomless pit where evil comes from and where it will, in the very end, go back. So you can see this worldview showing up as this story about the demon-possessed man is told and retold. His demons come from the abyss in this worldview, and it is to the abyss they will return in the end times. 
Everyone hearing the story understands this, and they understand that the demons are begging for time. In all three versions, the demons know that it's not the end time yet. So they beg Jesus not to send them into eternal torment, but to send them into the pigs. And Jesus agrees. The herd of pigs, 2,000 of them, according to Mark, rush headlong down the steep embankment and plunge into the sea where they are drowned. The pig herders, of course, rush into town to, to tell everyone what just happened. Matthew says the people come and beg Jesus to leave their area. I guess to them, the loss of 2,000 pigs isn't worth the restored life of this man. But Mark and Luke add some more detail. They say that when the townspeople arrive, the man who has been delivered is dressed and perfectly sane, no ranting or raving. The man begs to go with Jesus. But as Jesus leaves to cross back over the Sea of Galilee, Jesus tells the man, no, you stay here with your own people. Tell them what God has done for you. And so, according to Mark and Luke's expanded versions of the story, this unnamed man becomes the first missionary to the Gentiles sent by Jesus. He stays and spreads the good news of what Jesus did all over the Decapolis. That is one crazy story, isn't it? The next one is interesting for different reasons. The next one is also in all three Gospels. Once again, Matthew's version is the shortest, while Mark's is the longest. But what is fascinating about this story is that in all three versions, it is told as an intercalation. We ran across another intercalation a couple of weeks ago. An intercalation is like an Oreo. It's where two stories are sandwiched together. You start with one story, the second story gets inserted like the creamy insides of the Oreo, and then you finish up with the first story. And that matters because it means the point of both stories is related. So whenever you notice an intercalation, you want to look at what the two stories have in common and then focus on that aspect of the middle story. That will be the core point. This literary technique is one way writers of this era emphasized a particularly important point. So let's see if we can figure this intercalation out. The first story is about a 12-year-old girl who has fallen gravely ill. Her father, Jairus, is an important leader in the local synagogue, so he's a really important Jew. So Jesus has probably known this family for years, actually. Knowing his daughter is on the point of death, Jairus comes to Jesus and falls at his feet. In Matthew's short version, Jairus does not come until his daughter has actually died. But Mark and Luke's longer stories say she is near death. Jairus says, please, if you will only come put your hand on her, my daughter will live. And so Jesus and the huge throng of people following him around go with Jairus, the synagogue leader. And now we come to the inserted story in the middle of the Oreo. In the crowd is a woman who has suffered from a blood flow for 12 years. She's been to doctor after doctor, spending every penny she has, but she's only gotten worse as each year passes. Her situation is hopeless. No money, no help. All that is left to her is to slowly bleed to death. She thinks to herself, maybe this Jesus, this famous healer can heal me. If I can only get close enough to touch his outer garment, I will be healed. Can you imagine the effort it must have taken her in her state to push through the crowd to get close enough to touch Jesus? And why did it seem important to her to touch his outer garment? 
That seems a little weird and specific to me. Well, a Jew in Jesus' day would have been wearing two garments. One was his inner garment. According to bridgesforpeace.com, this would have been a long, close-fitting tunic woven of linen or wool fabric. Most tunics like this would be, you know, woven as one long rectangular piece, hole cut in the middle, and, you know, side seams sewed up along the sides. But we find out later in the Gospels that Jesus' inner chaluk has been woven with a special technique we now call double weave, where the fabric is woven as a single tubular piece, so there are no seams in it. This would have been an expensive gift to him, or perhaps he has a particularly talented weaver in the family. He would also be wearing an outer garment called a talit. This is a square fabric, basically a shawl that is thrown over his shoulders. Now this particular garment, the outer garment is always seamless and on its corners are special tassels with a particular significance to the Jews. These talits are still worn in worship today as prayer shawls. Here's a picture of one. You can see the fringe all along the edge, but there are four special tassels on each corner. Over the generations, these four tassels have come to be endowed with all sorts of special traditions and meanings and you nod them a certain way. But the core meaning is found way back in Numbers 15 when the Hebrews were wandering around in the desert. God tells the people, for generations to come, you are to wear tassels with a blue cord on the corners of your garments. You will look at them and be reminded to follow the commands of the Lord and not the lusts of your own hearts. Now, you know, this is one of a zillion, you know, 630 commands or something that are, you know, in the law of Moses. And this may look like a small throwaway verse, except it is followed by this statement. I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, this phrase, I am the Lord your God, is used to emphasize a passage. It's like putting it in bold print. It's, it's indicating that what has been said or is about to be said is super important. And this passage has been double emphasized. God, when God refers to the Exodus, that adds another layer of emphasis. So it's like triple emphasized. It's got, I am the Lord your God twice, and it's got the Exodus referred to in the middle of it. So that makes this particular little tiny command a very big deal. God wants us to have some physical daily reminder that whenever we see it, we pause to remember that we follow God. It's actually worthwhile to go through your Bible and highlight the places this phrase, I am the Lord your God, is used and reflect on those passages. Certainly, the Jews um, definitely realize this particular passage is a very big deal, and so they all wear these shawls with tassels on them. And these special tassels on the corners have blue cord in them. Um, so this, in Jesus' day, would have been referred to as their outer garment. It is this garment that the dying woman is trying to touch. This garment is a physical symbol of Jesus' faithfulness to God. This is what she wants to touch. And she does it. She is able to get close enough to Jesus to touch the tassel on his garment. And she is healed. She feels it immediately in her body. She knows that the bleeding has stopped. Jesus feels the rush of the Holy Spirit too. He knows something has just happened. He turns around and says, who touched me? The woman knows she's in trouble now. 
For one thing, she's been bleeding. She's unclean. She's not supposed to be touching anyone, much less a holy man. Well, Jesus' disciples haven't felt a thing. They say, what do you mean who touched you? You're in the middle of a crowd. People are jostling you from all sides. But Jesus keeps looking around to see who it is that touched him. Seeing she's caught, the woman throws herself at his feet, shaking with fear, and tells him the whole truth. And Jesus says, daughter, your own faith has healed you. Go in peace and be whole, healed of this scourge. The word that is translated here as healed is the exact same Greek word as the word saved. It's the word sozo. We've already seen how Jesus' whole ministry is grounded and rooted in healing for the people, for us, healing inside and out. This is exactly what was prophesied about him even before he was born. The angel of the Lord told Joseph that Mary would have a son and he was to name the boy Jesus, a Hebrew word meaning God is salvation, for he would save his people from their failures, their sins. See how the word, um, salvation in Hebrew is associated with deliverance and rescue and how the Greek word for salvation is associated with healing. Salvation is healing. These aren't just synonymous. They're at least in the Greek exactly the same word. The woman touches Jesus' prayer shawl and is healed physically. Jesus himself has come to heal us to make us whole, to fix all the damage done by our failures, our sins. This is how Jesus saves us. The other thing I want you to notice here is what healed this woman. It is not something magical about Jesus' clothes. It is her own faith that heals her. So why isn't everyone who believes immediately healed? I don't know. Is it because this miracle is a particular billboard for a particular place and time? Is it because if everyone is healed and no one dies of any cause, then the world would become overcrowded and miserable almost immediately? Is it because we are actually all are healed in pretzel time, kairos time, God time, where what was and is and is to come all converge? You will have to answer this for yourself. For now, it is enough to know that this woman is healed through her own agency. So Jairus has been waiting next to Jesus this whole time. The urgency in his heart must be overwhelming. How he must have wanted to yank Jesus' arm and drag him out of there and come heal his little daughter. But just at this moment, people from Jairus' house arrive to tell him his daughter has died. There is no point in bothering Jesus anymore. Jairus, of course, is heartbroken, but Jesus says, don't pay any attention to that. Do not fear. Only believe. Jesus makes everyone in the crowd stay behind, except Peter and the brothers James and John. As they approach Jairus' house, they see throngs of people weeping and wailing. Jesus says, what's all the fuss about? She's not dead. She's only sleeping. You can feel the heartbeat of shocked silence before the people burst out laughing at Jesus. Crazy man, obviously the girl is dead as a doornail. Jesus has the last laugh though. He throws all those people out and he takes Jairus and his wife and the three disciples with him. And they go in to where the girl has been laid. Jesus takes her by the hand and says in Aramaic, little girl get up. And immediately she stands up and begins walking around. 
everyone is completely amazed and overjoyed, and Jesus tells them to give her something to eat. In Mark's version, Jesus tells them not to tell anyone what has happened, which of course makes no sense. So neither Matthew nor Luke include that bit. In my separate class on the Gospel of Mark, um, we discover that Mark uses the motif of a secret as a literary device throughout his book. So I don't think we need to take that phrase in Mark literally. It's highly likely Jesus never said any such thing, but that Mark added it as a way of tying his story together. You may have forgotten by now that this is an intercalation. The story begins with Jairus begging Jesus to come heal his daughter. The story of the bleeding woman is inserted and Jesus tells her, my daughter, your faith has healed you. And then the story of Jairus concludes with Jesus telling the people the little girl is not dead, only sleeping. He says, little girl, get up, and she arises. Since it's an intercalation, we need to look for the commonalities and differences between the stories to see what the important parts are. One commonality is that both stories include daughters. This is the only time Jesus addresses a woman as daughter. He uses the phrase daughters of Jerusalem at one point in Luke, but it can certainly be no accident that in every version of this gospel, God call, uh, God, Jesus calls this bleeding woman daughter. And both stories involve healing and deliverance from death. But the difference in the two stories seems to be that in the outer story, the daughter has no agency. She's already been declared dead, but Jesus says she is actually alive. Whereas in the inner story, the woman is alive, seems alive, but is actually dying. She exercises what little agency she has and discovers that the kingdom of God is hers. She has more agency than she ever realized. So one big point of this intercalation is that the kingdom of God is ours. We are sons and daughters of the king. The second core point of the intercalation is that Jesus has come to heal us. That's what salvation means. And the healing involves us taking our own steps, whatever steps we can. We must believe like this woman and trust like Jairus that God intends to heal us. Healing is the whole point. Wholeness is ours. Life is ours. Life is far more than what is limited by our physical condition. We are more than our bodies. And death never has the last word. What a wonderful, wonderful story. In our breakout groups, we're going to have some fun looking at verses where the word salvation is used and substituting the words healing or wholeness. Hey there. Yay. Was that wow, a Wow, this was good stuff. <laughs> I, I thought that might be a fun discussion. Yeah, it was so simple. We talked about the Super Bowl. <laughs> 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 Mary, I'm sorry oh, we lost you. Yeah, there were several people having technical difficulties today. You know, the it would keep popping them out. We'd throw them back in. It wasn't just one person. <laughs> oh, like hey, popping out of the sea. <laughs> heal so, them. You so what? Them. So what did you, you heal do? them? You save them. I didn't save them. I just put them back in play. That's all. <laughs> what did y'all, did those verses look different? Yes. Yes. Tell me about yes. it. We talked about the difference between being healed and being cured. 
Mm. Uh, Tell me about that. So was, well, he, healing to me means being made whole. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that means um, being reconnected with God and maybe also mean, might mean being reconnected with your community. Uh, that was something that, that was brought up. Um, but cured means your injury, your disability, your, your illness automatically goes away, gone. Now, as, as Marlene mentioned, the, the miracles that are described in the Bible and the New Testament all do seem to imply that the physical injury, disability, et cetera, has gone away. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that. That's true. But also think how many times Jesus said, and go and sin no more. And your sins are forgiven. You know, and go back to your community. And go back home, talk to people. Restoring relationship with God and your community. Yes. And I, as, well, as well as the amount of times, and I hope I can get through this other topic, as well as the amount of times that Jesus um, basically taught us <clears throat> to look at the people that we we're casting poor dispersion and judgment on in new light and that that's healing for them because they're no longer judged for the, what the society perceives them as. Yeah. That, that's a really great point that the community itself has a responsibility for this healing. The community, the community reaching out to the disabled or injured person or ill person that is a form of restoration of the person with their community. Yeah. Well, and mean, that I, person being able to reach out is also a healing for them instead of being judgmental. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, it, it, it's mentioned in the Gospels um, with the blind man when Jesus' disciples asked, you know, who sinned? this man or his parents that he was born blind and even today in many many faith communities if someone has a serious illness cancer or something like that I mean this happened to my sister-in-law people from her Sunday school class at her church came to her and implied that she had unconfessed sin in her life and that's why God afflicted her with cancer wow um, and, um, and so we seem to continue to carry this prejudice that illness is somehow a value judgment on our worth in God's eyes. And that all we have to do is just get right with God, quote unquote, and our illness will magically disappear. Where so often that regardless of how close you are to God, that doesn't happen. So obviously that's not what scripture is talking about. Because otherwise, everyone who was spiritually close to God would be miraculously healed. And live sure. forever and never die. And, you know, which seems to be the promise, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know that happened to my mother, too, not just from outside, not just physically, but um, recently, as she's become extremely elderly and her body begins to shut down and things don't work the way she had sure. expected there has been a um it has come to a, as a shock to her because she felt like she had done everything right mm -hmm. you know? she had internalized this message well, and the, the internal part of it, I thought was really important, especially back in that culture. If you had, if a person had some sort of illness, they would feel disconnected from God. They would feel like they, they would, it would be their understanding that they had this because God was punishing them. Right. And I think that's more of what I meant. I'm sorry, cut off earlier. I 
I agree that the community, that we all have a responsibility in healing with each other. But when we were talking about the examples of things that Jesus showed us, I meant that Jesus showed healing behavior in his interactions with, as, as you know, his prime example is our lessons of how we should be treating people too. And that our judgment is causing their sickness. <laughs> Yes, I love that phrase, healing behavior, showing healing behavior rather than judgment. What a great, great idea. Who thought of that? <laughs> yeah. I, I was telling I was telling our group that um, I am going to be starting to attend a four week course at my church tonight on disability theology. Mm. And it's led by the seminary intern who has a congenital condition where the opening at the base of her skull is a little larger than it should be. So part of her brain stem slips down outside of her skull, which causes her to be in constant severe pain and, um, and a seizure disorder and other significantly debilitating conditions. But you would never know this just seeing her and talking to her. It's, it's all invisible disability. Um, but delving into our own misgivings about disability, its implications, spiritual as well as physical, um, and our beliefs about what God wants for us in a physical sense and, and what we should be seeking if we have a disability or a serious illness um, that would be more consistent with what God desires for us. And the whole idea that there's one way to be whole. Exactly. That's something that I learned in seminary, um, talking about ableism and you know, and preaching these kinds of gospels and how we need to be cognizant of how it lands when the blind person always has to be healed. I mean, just because you're blind doesn't mean you, you are deficient in any way that or that you need healing. You know, Jesus always asked, do you want to be, do you want that thing to be healed or not? It was a choice. Yeah. I remember being shocked a few years ago when I learned that there are many, many people in the deaf community who will not allow their deaf children to have cochlear implants mm -hmm. because they feel that it would make their lives less rich mm -hmm. rather than living within the deaf community. Mm -hmm. So That's Marlene, amazing. if I can address that very quickly, I have a very good friend whose parents are both deaf and she's an interpreter. And we've discussed this conversation because most, she's a crafting person and most of the people I've met through her um, are deaf. And there's just a lot of other implications. Um, it's not just as simple as, um, but yes, it does kind of remove a child from a community to exist in, but um, cochlear implants in children also prevent them from getting some medical um, tests and stuff later. It's just a, it's a pretty um, significant, complicated decision. Well, I, I, well, I, I agree. Um, but the, the takeaway I took from this documentary I saw and then conversation with a woman who is an interpreter um, was that they don't see being deaf as something that needs to be fixed right mm -hmm. correct and so you fall into into what gail was saying about jesus would always ask do you want to be healed correct if you see it as something that needs to be fixed then we shouldn't be imposing fixing it on people that we see as needing it mary Agreed. i saw i saw you try to contribute were you trying to say something a minute ago Oh, I'm just listening, Gail. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Rich conversation. Thank you. Yes. I don't. I don't mean to be the hog every time I get on this, but I want. I. I just want to share. I've shared the story before. I think that this entire healed conversation reminds me 
of um, two women that I used to teach with. And one was a good friend of mine who's Mormon. And another lady that she taught with that I knew very well um, was her husband was a deacon in the Bast Bast um, Baptist church. And she would walk up to my friend who was Mormon and put her arm around her and say, you know, Harry, Carol, I, I worry for your salvation because she's Mormon. And my Mormon friend would look back at her and say, and I worry for yours too. And, <laughs> and, and this is this whole idea that we have some idea about how to heal people and God's job. So I, I love this lesson today. Mm. <laughs> and that kind of touches on that last quote. Did y'all get to, num to number six, X 412? That says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which it is necessary to be saved. Um, and I, I uh, just wanted to tease that one out a bit, because that verse doesn't actually get fixed when you add in wholeness and healing, does it? Um, it, right. it? You know, you can say wholeness and healing is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven by which it is necessary to be whole or to be healed it's still a little Gail, you're there. saying that you don't think that it works there well no i think it worked the, the words work there but the verse still has issues <laughs> and yeah, that information of necessary right it's well and and of this exclusive Civity, I can't even say the word, but but what Joe was talking about, where you know, is the Mormon right or is the non-Mormon right? You know, uh -huh. is is one of them yeah. going to be saved yeah. and the other not? So what it I want to do, huh? I'm I want to put I, this. I, I want to put this into context for you, though, before we interpret it. I want you to know the story that this verse is being extracted from, and we'll look at it more in context when we get there. But what has happened is Peter and one of the other disciples, can't remember who, has been got in trouble because they healed somebody. <laughs> and this is after Jesus cruci crucifix. Jesus is gone. Jesus has already gone back to heaven. And and um, after his resurrection. So uh, this is in the book of Acts. And they've healed somebody and they've got called into court. And their explanation is kind of several verses this being the core part of it but they it basically they said well we did it in the name of Jesus but if you look at the Greek the word transfer translated as name there which does mean name means authority of Jesus and and so it was it was part of Jesus giving them authority to do these kinds of things, which we get to like in the next lesson, next week or the next after it, you know, real soon, we're going to be seeing Jesus giving these particular men that jurisdiction, that authority. And, um, and, and them saying, and so what this is, is if you understand that, what this verse ends up saying is that this wholeness and, and healing that we've done isn't found anywhere else. There isn't another authority under heaven that they don't have. What they're saying is we don't have anything but Jesus. That's the only authority we've got. Okay. It's, 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 that's the one we use. That's the only one we know of <laughs> um, that can heal this way. And then that ver that that last bit about it being necessary to be saved but what it's saying is it's necessary it is absolutely necessary that we be healed one of the dictionaries i looked at translated as it is an it is inevitable that we be healed it would make more sense to me if it said um by which it is possible to be saved. I know, but, but that's but God's aim is to heal every single one of us. God is going to make that happen. Martha. Okay, okay. 
Gail, I appreciate your explanation. Could you now um, say X412, it's, it's meaning, it, can you say that again in a sentence with, the, with that interpretation so that your interpretation is- I can say it with my interpretation. Clear, can you restate it? Yeah, I can restate yeah, it yeah. with my interpretation of it as long as you understand this is my interpretation of it. This is not the only way exactly. to see this verse or this passage, all right? But what I think they are saying in their defense when they're hauled into court for having healed is we did it by the authority of Jesus. We that is the only place that this healing and wholeness comes from. It's not coming from us. It is, there is, there is no other name besides Jesus who, besides this, there is no authority besides that, that we're operating in. We, it, it, it is, that we are operating in. That's right. This is their defense. Okay. They're trying to say what, how how they come to be allowed to do this kind of thing all right and the, and and this is their defense and and they said it is by that authority that was given to us and it and it is in that authority that it is absolutely necessary to be healed and made it. So is it saying is it saying that, that authority that Jesus that Jesus essentially requires that we heal people? Yeah, that we heal we heal people uh -huh. and be healed, right? Oh, Woody. <laughs> I'm sorry, this this says was, was to be bad. healed. They said we healed, and it is a necessity to be healed. It is. This is what God is up to. This is the authority we're operating under. We are to bring that healing. And to I have a question. What you're also saying, right, Gail? Pardon me? To, not I only have, we are to bring that healing, yeah. but we are to ask, if I can ask a question. Shirley wants to ask a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's God's desire that we all be healed. And um, we, you know, have talked about it before, that it's God's desire that we all be healed. But we also have free will. So are we not capable of rejecting that healing? Certainly. That's why Jesus always asked if they wanted to be healed. Mar Marlene, you were saying yeah. something. Oh, I was just, I was just saying, um, Martha and Woody were talking about um, that, that part of the interpretation of that verse was that we are to bring healing. But I gather from what you were saying is that we are also to be healed. Um, that it's a, it's a two way thing that, that um, it is necessary for us to be healed as well as for us to bring healing yes and we're talking is that, and, is that a correct understanding yeah I, I i if you recall back and um if you in the sermon on the mount series the thing jesus started out with was deal with your junk be healed first then you go out and be disciples mm -hmm. And I think so something it's that just up in the chat. You see, Donna is she's got stuff in the chat. I don't... Okay, why don't you read it to us, Rhonda? Uh, first, she said um, this is when we first started, but it still says that Jesus is the only way. It has to be Jesus, not any other way. And then and she said, "How I read it and what I get out of it wondered." And then she just asked, "Why can't we heal ourselves?" <laughs> okay. So in that first set, that was what we were talking about. This verse, you have to take it in the context of this being Peter's defense in a court of law as to how he had the authority to do what he was doing. The problem is that Christians, I think, have taken this little verse 
out of its context and used it in inappropriate ways. Okay. That's just how I see it. Doesn't have to be so that. It could, it could be broadened. It could be broadened to say something like there is no other path. I, I would you know, was... all they were saying is they were asked, in whose authority do you do this? And they said, Jesus, it's the only one we know. <laughs> Right, but in the modern in the modern context, mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you take that out of context, out of that context, and say that it has to be Jesus, then that would mean that any non Christian cannot be saved, cannot be healed, cannot be healed. Right? Does that make sense? No. I mean, what about doctors? <laughs> doctors, yeah, but that's but that's that's what is taught in in many churches around the world what Woody was saying is taking this completely out of context and and ignoring the conditions under which it was said yeah and, and there and absolutely general. jesus heals us but jesus himself kept pointing back to god said saying god God is healing you. This is the good news. God wants the lame to walk and the blind to see. And he wasn't just speaking physically, you know, he was also speaking metaphorically and spiritually. Um, this is about God's purpose, which gets back to Shirley's excellent question, which was, do we have free will or not? Right. And, and I, and I think that, I think that Absolutely. Well, clearly we have free will because Jesus kept asking if we want to be healed. But God's end game is that we be healed and made whole. And perhaps part of it, it comes with our eyes ultimately being opened. You know, when God comes and set things right, and we've been talking about what happens at that end time and how people who have, you know, completely screwed up. <laughs> There's this time of regret and weeping and wailing of gnashing of teeth, which implies that they understand what they did. You know, they understand what they missed. That's kind of, you know, the arc towards healing that I see. That's what I see in my heart. That's what I see in the Bible. That's what I see in Jesus' words. Um, and that's the arc we're traveling in this class. I could be wrong. You know what? I could be dead wrong, and I still trust God that God's going to take care of me. You know, I can't go too far wrong if if I believe that, as you all have been saying, I need to be part of the healing. Mary, my question is, and I I said it in my group. There is absolutely no disrespect offered by me to another's belief, but in my own theology, in my own journey, so much of this becomes um, troublesome for me at times if I predicate my belief system on original sin, which is the baseline for most. And that's not what... I personally ascribe to in this part of my journey, and I, again, no disrespect to anyone that thinks differently, but when you predicate all of this on the concept of and the belief of original sin as opposed to original blessing, I think that's when I get lost in the weeds and, and really struggle. Now, I, with that said, that struggle has deepened my faith. It has not hurt me. It is, so there's a reason for all that. But I, I just think that that's, boy, that's hard. And I was so glad, and I've been wanting to ask this for a couple of weeks, and Shirley raised the issue of free will. I had always ascribed to free will. It was my tradition. We were That was a gift, was free will. As I've deepened my faith and I try to understand God's will more than my own 
free will to choose. I'm at a different place on that. Will we address that at some point about that? Because that is something I've worked on for years, Gail. What holding on to free will, I can see the benefits of it stepping into the mind of Christ and really embracing God's will is a whole different thing. You know? So let me say that all of the free will discussion is not some is is something that kind of is a derivative kind of theology it's not like there's a verse on it or something that i'm going to point to mm -hmm. uh -huh. um but we've learned a lot about god's will and what that looks like and we know from experience um that we have free will and to me, so often growing up, at least in the tradition I grew up in, it was presented as in dualistic terms. My will, wicked, bad. God's will, really good. You got to stop it and choose God's will, you know? And, 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 that, some, and, that, and that Jesus will you know, erase all that dark and blackness that is my will, okay? And a lot of that is derivative from Paul's teachings. So, mm -hmm. but what if it's not dualistic? We haven't found God to be dualistic, have we? Uh, you know, no. what if it's more like God is the sea that we are swimming in? God is the air that we breathe. God is the love pulsing into our hearts and into each and every one of us. And what if our will is whether we want to align with that or not? You know, that our will is like a, a thread in the community of faith. In the, in the world, our will, we can go up and we can go down and other people can go this way and that way. Together, we are participating, aligning ourselves, being part of what God is weaving in this world. And, and I don't think it means that we are in any way called to give up our will. I think our will is a beautiful gift from God to be used. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble following this. I think there is such a thing as God's will. Mm -hmm. And then we can either choose to follow God's will or not. Now, I that, don't think it's as linear as that. Okay, I, don't, I, I guess what I'm trying to suggest that it may not be like, I-35 is God's will, and 620 isn't. <laughs> you know? or, you or better get off 620. Or, or not, <laughs> Pardon, Martha? Or not necessarily dualistic, God's will or my will. Um, alignment is a word that makes sense in a lot of situations, and... Um, we do pray in the Our Father, not my will, but your will be done on earth and in heaven, um, which gets into some of the, where you're finding some, some or where there's some issues being, being brought up, but I'm not sure it's, it's dualistic because I remember the conversation you and I had in 2008 when I said, Gail, I've got several really attractive options in front of me. How do I choose? How do I know what, which one of those God wants and what your response was, you get to choose. You get to make that choice. And um, so as I'm thinking about that is, is God's will isn't necessarily singular, right? It is if God's choice is wholeness and love, and our choice is wholeness and love, 
can play out in a lot of ways. It's like I see God's will as like this endpoint that we're all heading towards, not the the particular path that we're getting there. You know. What 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 I think I'm understanding from what you're saying when you're talking about the the, the ocean that we swim in and the air that we breathe um, is this idea that. Um, God's will for all of God's creation is is wholeness and integration and joy and all of these wonderful things. And we can use our will to discover what in that sort of grab bag or ocean or 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 environment that is God's will what things will be that to us and then what we can then do to help be that to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does, and I think that, that, yeah, it's, it's like we have particular gifts. We have, our will is unique to us um, and, and it can be whole and whole and good and, and participatory in healing the world and healing us or not um, right you know we all struggle with times when it's not <laughs> you know and, and i think right. that's what the prayer is about right I, I if i can i as we keep talking if you take a point a dot or a ball and and you shoot it off in direction it exponentially multiplies into like 389 million ways it could go. We talk about that with time and where you are. And as we've talked about this Bible the whole time, what I have taken away from this is overarching theme is that we have two rules here. Love and know God, love each other. And if I make that the center, that dot, Everything else in this Bible that we talk about is a shoot off of that. And this includes this healing. Healing is going to require me to know and love God and to love one another. And other people need that healing as well. And we, weeks ago, I had a breakdown about my guilt over what it meant to be fishers of men. And I was holding on to this guilt and burden that was taught now in a way that is not consistent at all with know and love God, love one another. My casting a net wasn't to make them Christian, it was to love one another. And if we did not have free will, we would all just be, I don't know, copies, robots. The free will has to exist. The free will has to exist to make a difference. And we all have a different gift at healing. Yeah, and the free will has to exist for us to be partnered with God, to respond to God. Absolutely. Who would want to I be married to somebody that didn't want, have a choice? Right, and that, that's I, I was trying to wrap up the thought and I lost it because I'm not feeling well, but it, it just all ties back in together to me that, I mean, everything just seems so much clearer now. Every time we talk about any of the issues here, that I start with, we're supposed to know and love God and love one another. That makes me happy. Well, thank you for that. So, so I'm, I don't want to downplay Woody's question. I think it's a valid question because I have to say there are times I want to take a baseball bat to people. <laughs> you know, that's what I would call my will. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and there are times that I have been hurt and I want to hurt back, you know, but I know that what God wants for that person or group of people or whatever is that they be allowed to go on down the road 
completely oblivious to how I feel about what just happened. Because God's going to deal with them in another way at another time and teach them in other ways that are far more loving than I would do right now, you know, <laughs> in the moment, you know? So that was you choosing to do God's will. That's but right. Maybe not everybody would do that. Some people might take that baseball bat and use it. And that would be, whether you call it my will or the opposite of God's will, whatever you call it, we have that free will to either choose God's will or not. Yes, that's right. But it has felt like a very big gift to me that I have enough years and experience behind me that I can see that even though things need to be said to a person or whatever, um, that now is not the time and I am not the one and that I can trust God will have them in God's hands. That I can trust that justice will happen in the sense that mercy will happen. And, and I, it doesn't have to be me. I think a whole lot of this is understanding that, that God's got this and I can let go. Sometimes the, you know, if you think about the expression, what's the most loving thing I can say or do right now? Sometimes when the most loving thing that I can say or do right now is nothing, which is sometimes the path that you take, Gail, sometimes that's also loving to ourselves. What's the damage that's done to everybody when we take it upon ourselves? What was, what was that quote? I don't know who said that quote, but hatred is like drinking poison and hoping the person who harmed you dies. <laughs> and sometimes we have to let go of the hatred and the anger that we're carrying around that is hurting us and not hurting them at all because they have no idea that we're carrying this around. Well, it isn't very self-healing to harbor this either whether we can let it go or not um yeah i that's what that dot thing it goes in all directions right kind of bouncing off what what martha said sometimes the loving thing to do is to do nothing but the 64 dollar question is to figure out when to do nothing and and when to do something Yes, and I've been very grateful for the knowledge that the Holy Spirit will take the words that I say and let the chaff drop to the floor <laughs> and let you guys only remember the good stuff. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and kind of the other way around. I just, I, I think we stress over this way too much. Um, I think that that, like Joe says, if we if we live in the principles and we understand, you know, the the basic mission, it's going to be okay. We're even if we did pick up the baseball bat and hurt somebody, it can still be made right. On that note of forgiveness, we are definitely out of time. This was a really wonderful topic, and and I'm 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 hoping that my computer doesn't go ah too big too big. So um, we will <laughs> we will continue next week um, with these wonderful you know parables and teachings of Jesus. I love you guys. Bye. 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 May I say thank you to Brian? He started this whole conversation off with a prayer for all of us. And thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, how <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.